Hi, everybody. My name is Tony Penny. I'm the Chief Learning Officer at the Ronald Reagan Presidential Foundation and Institute. Thank you for joining us for our virtual Constitution Day 2020. I am joined this morning by three very special guests. I have Xander, I have Kelsey, and I have Miss Sydney, who are going to lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance this morning. Uh, so with that, I'm going to turn it over to Miss Sydney. Go ahead. Put your right hand over your heart. Ready, begin. I pledge Excellent. Oh my God, you three did such a wonderful job. Thank you for helping us kick off this wonderful day and reminding us of why we all get into this education and, and worry about teaching things like the Constitution and voter education. I want to give you a big round of applause. Thank you both, uh, all three of you very much. And we will see you later. Thank you for, for being with us this morning. Well, that was a wonderful way to kick off today's event. Um, and I, before we get started, before we introduce our speakers to the stage, uh, I want to take just a second to thank the people who made today possible. Uh, so I want to thank all the planning partners who are a part of making this thing happen today. So Michelle Herzog from the LA County Office of Education, the Queen of Social Studies. Michelle, as always, thank you for, for wrangling us all together. Uh, Damon Huss from the Constitutional Rights Foundation. Thank you, sir. Maria Gallo from the Center for Civic Education. Stephanie Enriquez and Renee Holes from the Ventura County Office of Education. And from our team here at the Reagan Foundation, I want to thank Megan Gately. I want to thank Whitney Pagan, who's been behind the scenes putting this whole thing together. Rebecca, our entire education team, thanks for all you do to make today possible. A um, couple of quick tech tips before I introduce our speakers to the stage. So we're using the Hopin platform. Uh, which some of you may be familiar with uh, in terms of browser. We recommend either Chrome or Firefox. If you run into any kind of technical difficulties during today's program, uh, the first step we would say is just hit refresh. Uh, and if you run into any serious problems on the sessions tab, um, there's a help desk and, and some of our staff will be there throughout the day to help you and, and help you get connected and, and that sort of thing. Um, after our keynote discussion, we'll invite you to join us in breakout discussions uh, by grade level in the sessions tab. Those will be live uh, immediately following our keynote talk. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about that as we get closer to that time. So with that, let me introduce our keynote speakers today. Um, first, I want to introduce to the stage Dr. Curry Sautner. She serves as the Chief Learning Officer at the National Constitution Center, where she oversees all aspects of the public's website experience. She leads the national as the development and distribution of programs and online offerings makes it the center's leading constitutional education resource. Uh, I know that she is starting off. This is a busy, busy week for her. You probably have programs going every day and, and multiple programs. Um, and they have just done remarkable work during the pandemic, uh, just in terms of what they've offered online. Um, and uh, in addition, she also serves on the executive board of the Civics Renewal Network, which has some great resources available for Constitution Day. Uh, so welcome, Curry. Good to see you. Thank you. Yes, it's a great it's a great way to kick off Constitution Week. So thank you for having me. It's really fun. Oh, absolutely. And our other keynote discussion uh, participant today is uh, Professor Dan Schnur. Dan Schnur teaches politics, communications, and leadership at USC, UC Berkeley, and Pepperdine. Uh, he's the founder of the USC LA Times statewide political poll. Previously, he has worked on four presidential and three gubernatorial campaigns as one of California's leading political strategists. He served as the National Director of Communications for the 2000 presidential campaign of Senator John McCain. Uh, and he also ran for statewide office for the California Secretary of State back in 2014. You might have seen his commentaries in the LA Times, the Wall Street Journal, the Washington Post, the New York Times, among many others. Or maybe you've seen him on TV, CNN, MSNBC, Fox News, NPR. Uh, at any rate, Dan, you do a lot. We're very excited to have you join us today. Tony, thank you so much for letting me join you. I like Curry. I'm really excited to be here and I'm really looking forward to the conversation. Excellent. Well, we're looking forward to it. We have uh, teachers uh, and, and educators tuning in from uh, from across the country today. Uh, so the first question I want to start with, it's it's Constitution Day 2020. 
Uh, and we are in the midst of a year that is unlike any other we've ever seen politically, uh, health wise, just in, I mean, um, you know, if you if you look at it historically, in, in some ways, 2020 is a combination of the pandemic uh, of the early 1900s, uh, either the uh, Depression or the Great Recession, um, the civil rights uh, movement of the 1960s. Uh, just we are facing an incredible amount of challenges, uh, partisanship that, that rivals maybe not the Civil War, but, uh, you know, there is an increasing kind of uh, split between our how we view ourselves politically. Uh, and in the midst of all this, we have an election. Uh, we have Constitution Day. So my first question to you is why in 2020? And I think this question alone could probably take us the entire time. But why in 2020 are things like the Constitution and voter education worth teaching in the classroom? Maybe I'll throw it to Curry first. Sure. Um, I, I always ponder like these big questions, like why is it worth teaching? And it, I mean, we know as a foundational concept that American participation in civic life is what is essential to having a thriving and productive democratic form of government. So 101, unless we're teaching it, unless they're doing it, it's not gonna work. I spent the entire week teaching about popular sovereignty and natural rights and rule of law, so I might be on a little kick on this, but the idea that we need an informed citizenry, we need an active citizenry, and that we have a government of the people, for the people, and by the people. And so that means the people need to know how it works and how they have voice and agency in the system because it is about representing them and they have that power in it so what i keep asking myself is is it why this year why now or is it why did it take us so long to get here and so that's really like the framing question i have around it why did it take us so long to get here but you're right we are here we're in like Lollapalooza of like civic engagement, everything going on. I mean, it is a festival of, you know, both positive and negative of moments of constitutional conversation. I mean, the constitution hasn't been this hot since 1787. <laughs> so that's a great thing for us. And that's a great thing for all the educators. But again, puts another big burden on schools and education to pick up that, pick up that mantra, pick up that goal and build the next generation of knowledgeable and active and understanding the process and being able to engage in a healthy civic way. That's a really important thing to do. And yeah, we have all the reasons why political dysfunction, you know, a polarized media, growing mobility in America changes the way people work. And I mean, the work that Peter Levine has done with Civic Deserts to look at that, how is it changing it? But our goal as educators, our goal as civic leaders is to say, how are we going to reinvent these civic communities with students, with families, with larger communities in different ways and new creative ways? And I mean, as much as COVID is so many negative things, we're making some lemonade here about recreating communities and saying, how do we engage in this? And how can we bring kids from all over the country to talk to each other about these big ideas? Well, online schooling is actually going to help that. But schools in general are that community, are that community to do this work. And again, putting more burdens on the teachers. But um, John and I and all the partners in this group are, are here to help. And when there's need, we're here to help and support and say, what do you want? We got your back and we're ready to dive in because teachers are really the ones who are putting that like, you know, that shot into the heart of civic education and bringing it back to life. So for me, it's it's about time. Let's go. <laughs> Excellent. Yeah, yeah. No, it's it's good to hear you say that the you know the Constitution is hot right now. It's a, you know the day when the Constitution is an influencer on Instagram and Snapchat is, is a happy day for all of us here today. Uh, but yeah, I want to turn to Dan and, and hear your thoughts. Why the Constitution? Why voter education in twenty twenty? Okay. So Tony, once again, I want to just let you know how grateful I am to be able to be with all of you here today. And to be on a panel, Curry in particular, she and her colleagues just do extraordinary work. And I've been a fan from a distance for some time. Um, I'm going to learn a lot over the next hour, and I know everyone else uh, is participating will also. Um, it's funny, I am um, many, many years ago, uh, 36 years ago, I drove from my hometown of Milwaukee, Wisconsin to Washington, DC in order to work for Ronald Reagan's reelection campaign. 
And so being here uh, now, working with you and your colleagues at the foundation of the Institute is a great privilege for me. And so it, it carries a uh, special meaning. But I'll tell you, as grateful as I am to be here uh, as part of the Foundation and Institute programming, I'm even more grateful to be here uh, with the incredible uh, elementary and secondary school teachers who are part of this program. Yeah, at USC, at Berkeley, at Pepperdine, me and my colleagues, we have the easy part. Um, we get to work with these amazing young people after you've gotten them ready for us. And I know that you probably as much or sometimes more than me on Zoom feel a little bit frustrated about trying to get through to young people who might wanna be doing something other than listening to me, imagine that. But whatever you're doing, it's working. And I speak on behalf of my colleagues at all three schools to let you know how grateful I am to you. So with that opening, Tony, I'm actually gonna answer your question now. And I wanna pick up where Curry left off because I think she made a series of really good points. But why now? Well, you talked earlier about this incredible conflation of a pandemic, a recession, a highly charged discussion of, of racial and social justice in this country. I read this week someone suggesting that this election was a combination of the elections of 1918, 1932, and 1968 all rolled into one. And Curry is exactly right. Uh, with the stakes at such a high level, and with there's so much uncertainty and confusion going on about how this election will take place logistically, I don't think there's ever been any more important time for educators to step forward and provide clarity, to, not just to their students, but to their students' parents and neighbors and communities who are genuinely confused about voter registration, about deadlines, about mail voting, about remote voting, and to explain not only how the process needs to work this year, but why it was set up the way it was. What I've found, and I'm sure everyone else in this conversation has found it too, the telling students the what isn't nearly important as telling them the why. And so even as we help them understand how to navigate this very confusing election season, is helping them understand the constitutional underpinnings that have set up this process the way it was. It's never been uh, more important. I couldn't agree with Curry more. Excellent. Well, let's 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 stick with the Constitution. We have two big topics we're going to jump in and explore today. One is the Constitution. The second is voter education. Obviously, they're uh, tied intricately. Um, but let's start with the Constitution. You know, one of the big national questions that that has uh, been taking place in, in a very public ways is what is the importance of American history, right? As we look at, you know, the, the, the ways that we're talking about our history and how do we reinterpret it and in light of the kind of uh, the social movements that are happening, what does our past mean? Um, let's, let's kind of, I'll, I'll go to you first, Curry, you know, so why should students know the story of the founding? How should they be looking at it? What should they be looking for? And, and how do teachers teach that at, at a time where, you know, kind of some of the foundations that we've looked to are, are being questioned in, in, in really big, major kind of public discussion sort of ways? Yeah, it's, it's a great question. And it, what, what we find at the center is as soon as we start kind of opening that box and saying, let's look at our past. You know, kids have this lens, and adults do too. They have this lens, but it's like old and stuffy and dusty and has no connection to them today. Um, and it, it doesn't. Things start making sense. So when you look and deep dive into the past, and it is essential to tell those past pieces of information through storytelling. So one of our, our educational philosophies starts with, you have to tell the past through storytelling of we the people. You need to ensure that you have a diverse perspective of people represented, but you have to tell their stories. We, we love and utilize primary sources and secondary sources, and we want to help give the voice to the past, but not take over that voice. There are amazing voices of the past. Just listen to them. You know, we read a piece from the, eight, the 1860s leading up to the 14th Amendment we read it out loud, one of our actors just performed it, and the kids in the audience had no frame of reference what it was, where it came from or anything. And we just played the game like, okay, what, when, did, when was this written? When did this person say this? 
And they could see the instant connection. Everybody in that room, they were all high school kids from Philadelphia, and they all thought it was last week. They're like, no, what they're talking about is this, this, and this. And then you unpack it and you go in deeper. But so that essential agency of telling, and John's right, why, you know, let's go to the past. Let's figure out why the heck it is. I always start every class we do with, okay, so what the heck is it? And why the heck do we have it? It's always like your first question, you know, like, why did they pick that? And you get back there. And then you understand, oh, so here's, here's our basement of our country and this is what we're built on so this is how the basement affects the upper floors you know and you understand that kind of framing around it so we really base everything in that storytelling and the use of those primary sources and every single way that you can get it in through video through live lectures through theater all those pieces and that's that's the fun part about being a civic ed organization you have all these tools at your disposal but then what our job is to really kind of go to next is look at that constitutional question over time. So we always want to say, like, what may the government do? What can it do? And kind of unpack that. So the history is so important so you can understand where we came from. You can understand the choices that were made in the past and directly chosen. And then how the legacy of that past is affecting us today. And I think what, and Dan will talk about this, he jumps into that kind of realm of, okay, how is it affecting us today? And we need to pull back and then see back and forth. And it's a continuum. It's never separated. And both are really important, two sides of one important coin. But it's essential to make sure that we're teaching this history through the agency of people, but with also so many methods. It does not have to be just reading. I love reading. I'm a nerd, super love nerd <laughs> reading, but we need to make sure we're making it accessible to all of our kids. So I like to hear it. I like to read it. I like to see it. Like I want all the layers in there. And then a lot of our kids that we work with want to do it. So like you want to do all those things together. So it, that is essential to making sure that we have a foundation of why the heck did they do it? Why does it matter? And then how does it affect me today? Excellent. And I want to I want to ask one quick follow up question before I get Dan's take on this question. But so you, you talked about the importance of narrative and obviously working in a museum. Museums are very concerned with narrative. How do we tell the story of our of our subject matter? Do you find in 2020, are there any <clears throat> kind of stories or, or pieces of narrative that students or teachers are connecting in particular? So if there's one story that people are latching on to from from the work that you do, what what is that? Um, it's a great question, and at, at times I do wonder: Does it change? Or are students students are always you know, they're always smarter than the rest of us? They, they, their curiosity is higher. Their questioning is better. You know, like we somehow ruin that as adults. Um, but when they're young, they're like unbelievably brilliant at that. I did my doctorate in creativity, so I know we actually do ruin it as adults. But um, you know, but they start off with like, wait, what's missing? So. My, my favorite moment at the Constitution Center um, was a moment we, we train police officers, uh, high school kids that we work with train police officers on the meaning of fairness and justice over time in America and what that looks like. And one of the young recruits, he was probably like 25 years old. He was looking at all these founding documents and saying like, why do we teach the founders? And, you know, we're, and we do a holistic job. We believe in the idea of teaching the whole history. And that includes the hard history. It's not just the glory and the, it's not the glory and the gore, it's all the pieces in between, really telling that full story. So he's in the museum and museums are, people collect stuff of people who they believe were important. So there's so many artifacts missing. We just opened a 19th Amendment exhibit and you'd be amazed at how many women's artifacts don't exist mm. anymore. You know they were there, but nobody saved them because they didn't see them of value. So one of the things the police officer said, he's, they're in the exhibit, they're looking around with the students, and he looks and goes, what's missing? And it was the best question that we should constantly ask ourselves when looking at history, when looking at our constitution, and when looking at museums, is where, where's the gap? Whose story isn't being told? Whose story wasn't remembered? Whose story wasn't saved? And then look further, how do we kind of fill out that whole history? And so we were kicking around literally last week. Do we start doing cases in exhibits that have nothing in them? 
and, and ask that question and then ask people to help fill in those stories. And so that's a super nerdy museum part of me, but like, imagine this online, imagine to say, look at your community, look at your country, look at your constitution, what pieces are missing, whose voice isn't being heard and always have that open blank case. Oh, fascinating. That's a, that's a really interesting approach. You know, they sometimes say history is told by the victors, but it's also told by the curators, right? Of the different museums and, and what they choose to, to include. Um, yeah. And so Dan, you know, same question to you. We are, you know, nearly two and a half centuries removed from the, from the constitution. Uh, when we think about, you know, that's, that's a long period of time in history with the rapid changes in transportation, communication, the way the political process works. We are a much different world than we were when, when this document was forged. So what's what's the relevance today, uh, in your opinion? Uh, I, I feel like I'm going to spend most of the hour, Tony, prefacing my answers with, I agree with Curry. <laughs> Curry said. Let me pick up on a point that Curry made. And I do want to pick up on a small point that she made just to underscore its importance. We tend to conflate history. Um, I tell my students, they hear me using the phrase in class, the modern era in the modern era of politics and the modern era of America. And by the second or third week of the semester, one of them will raise their hand and ask me to define the modern era. And I will say, well, the modern era of politics began on July 31st, 1963. That is the day that I was born and everything that happened before that was prehistoric and everything that happened after that is contemporary. And yes, that will be on the midterm. And I'll admit, I really do have it in my head somewhere that Aristotle, and Abraham and Eisenhower all hung out together. And it really does take an effort for people whose definition of modern history is even more contemporary than mine to unpack the various stages that we went through. And one point that I try to stress from the constitution more than any other is not just a phrase, but a word, the word more, and the word more within the phrase more perfect union to make it clear to them that we are still a work in progress and that each step along the way from the founders through the civil rights era to today, it's still a struggle and we're never going to achieve at the ultimate goal. But the point is they learned in their high school literature classes. Um, it's not the journey. It's not the destination. It's the journey that gets you there. So helping them put it where we are in some kind of context, not that either the 1780s or the 2020s are a culmination, but rather just another stop uh, on the journey. The one specific example I'll give them, and this gets back to the what and the why, is particularly in this election, is we're talking a lot about the Electoral College. Because, of course, this huge controversy is going on, as it did in 2016, as it did in 2000, <clears throat> about the... Uh, about the, the use of an electoral college versus the election of a president with a popular vote. Now, it's not my place in the classroom um, to take sides in this debate. I don't tell them who I'm voting for. I don't tell them what I think about taxes or immigration or climate change, because I don't think it's my place to impose my opinion on them. And I want a student who may disagree with me on an issue or a candidate to feel just as comfortable participating is one who does. Um, but explaining to them that the fact that there is an electoral college, and I say this from Los Angeles, isn't just designed to be mean to California. Um, yeah, the, and we taught, we use it as a jumping off point. The fact that Biden in all likelihood will win the popular vote the way Clinton did four years ago. I point out to them with a relatively small shift of votes in 2004, if John Kerry had carried just a, you know, 20, 30,000 more votes in the state of Ohio in 2004, he would have won the electoral college, but lost the popular vote to George W. Bush. And so we use this as a jumping off point, not to take sides on whether it's right or wrong, at least from my perspective, but to talk about the rights of the minority and to talk about the extraordinary compromise between large and small states and use that as a jumping off point to talk about the necessity of compromise in politics and in government and in, in our lives. Um, I'll be presumptuous enough, Tony, if I can, sure. um, to pick up on your follow-up question to Curry and offer a couple thoughts of mine modestly. Um, rather than my narratives, um, I owe a huge debt, and I think we all do, to Lin-Manuel Manuel Miranda, um, because he and his colleagues and his fellow creators of Hamilton 
um, have made the Constitution a much more interesting and exciting thing for my students than I ever dreamt that it would be. And so when I use for them a phrase in the room where it happens, they think of Alexander Hamilton, not John Bolton, and it relates to them in a way that it might not under other circumstances. The other tip I'll offer, particularly for those of you um, who have, uh, uh, who are teaching high school students, particularly 11th or 12th grade, I'm gonna recommend a phenomenal book because for a young person, watching their parents dealing with a the recession, themselves dealing with a pandemic, watching once again, this highly charged debate over race relations and social justice in this country. Let me recommend a, ter a terrific book uh, by John Meacham, the historian. Uh, and the book's it's called The Soul of America. And Soul of America is a few years old, but it's a really tremendous way of reminding us that as Mark Twain once said, history doesn't repeat itself, but it rhymes. And for us to not only be reminded that there are similar instances of division in our nation's history, but also to be reminded of or learn for the first time how good men and women got past those divisions to move us forward. I think it's a really instructive thing for students and for us to remember when the challenges do seem extremely formidable. Excellent. Yeah. And I see uh, Curry is putting some uh, links in the chat. Uh, so if, for those of us who, for those of you who are watching, uh, there are a couple of different chats. One is the event chat. One is the stage chat. Uh, and since we're on the stage, if anybody has any questions as we're going through this conversation that you want me to, to pose to our panelists, feel free to just uh, put them in the, in the stage chat. And I know uh, we'll probably be sharing some of the resources there. I want to follow up to something that you said, Dan, and stick with this, this, uh, you know, the topic of the Constitution and history, and, and that's context. Um, context seems kind of a, a tricky question for those who teach history, those who teach uh, the Constitution today. And that is the way that the context of the events that happened in the 1780s, the 1960s, you know, the early 1900s, the context, the political climate of the time, the historical context, the, you know, the what was available in terms of mass communication uh, and, and, you know, what kind of prevailing popular beliefs were at the time. It's sometimes very difficult for students in the context of their own life. And you were talking about the context of your life. Everything before you were born was prehistoric and, and students see that. You know, I, I know working at the Reagan Library, you know, for, for students who come through the library today, Ronald Reagan might as well be Abraham Lincoln, might as well be George Washington, right? Just a, somebody who was president before my lifetime. So how would either of you recommend teachers approach that very delicate question of context? Um, because there are some, you know, some interpretations. Well, they did this in history. We now view this as wrong, so it's wrong, right? Um, but how do you, you know, kind of make that complex history? In, in my opinion, it's a really complex topic to teach because of everything that's changed so much over over the course of time. So I'll just throw that out to you: the the challenge of context in teaching history. Well, I'm tempted to say I agree with Curry because even though I haven't heard her yet, I'm pretty confident that I will. But I'll offer a, a quick thought. <laughs> You get to go first this time. <laughs> but, I'll offer, but, but, but let me offer a quick thought. And once again, just the unique and I think immeasurably valuable opportunities that this era presents us as teachers. Um, if I had been talking four years ago about, for example, our, founder, our founders owning slaves, that's a fairly abstract conversation. But now in the middle of this extremely heated emotional debate about what statues should remain in place in our public square, should there be explanations offered, should they be moved to museums, should be they left as they are, there's a, there's a, there's a contemporary relevance that simply hadn't existed um, in previous semesters that I've taught at least. And so helping them understand not to excuse slavery, not by any stretch of the imagination, but explain societal norms of the 18th and 19th and 20th centuries is a really neat opportunity I've found. And one thing that I've uh, stumbled on that I think helps them understand that a little bit more than they might otherwise is I tell them that Barack Obama did not support same-sex marriage until roughly halfway through his time as president of the United States. Now, in the eight years since Obama took that position, public support uh, for 
uh, for same-sex marriage has grown tremendously. I've seen public opinion shift on that probably more rapidly than almost any other cultural issue in, wait for it, modern political history. But what I would say is helping them understand how rapidly public opinion can change on something that they take for the most part in Generation Z is just a matter of course and can help them understand that if public opinion shifts that dramatically just in a few years in the 21st century, maybe they can look back at past attitudes and behaviors to understand better um, how we ought to judge someone through the lens of their own place in history, not to excuse that past behavior, but as you put it appropriately, Tony, to put it in the appropriate context. Excellent. And Curry, what, what about you? What do you think about that? I'm going to start with, I totally agree with Dan. <laughs> uh, and I, I've been doing the opposite. Every time you speak, Dan, I try to snap, I'm like snapping my fingers. I'm like, okay, put that down. Uh, just because I'm in concurrence with you and what you're saying. And I totally agree. Um, yeah, context, I mean, context is everything. Um, and it's every, and we know that it's every day, the context that you're speaking and the tone, like all those things matter. So I think it's unbelievably important to ensure that people's history is is well-rounded and full so they have all the information because that we still know that that schools and teachers and adults don't have the full understanding and they still coming with oh well i was taught this way and it's like okay got it so let me give you a little bit more information let me give you a little bit more history let me show you a few more perspectives on that um i think we do a, a thing in history where we either vilify or heroify people um, and I, I mean, I like to totally vilify Thomas Jefferson, so I, I'm, I'm faulted for it as well. Um, but we need to, we, we need to understand what was going on in that moment. We need to understand historical and social context of that moment, and and be honest about it too, because you know we we hear all this information and we're getting this, and then I, you also hear the other extreme, which is like they didn't know any better, and it's like mm, no, let's let's be honest, they did. And here's all the writings that can prove that they knew didn't they did know better. So it is really and John's I mean Dan's right, and you gotta give it the whole context and say, here's what they're saying about it. Here's their actions, here's what they're saying, and here's what they're doing. And that's the part of history that I think is the most fascinating when we're talking about the founding era. They're not heroes or villains, they're both. You know, they're they're amazing in one respect and horrible in the next. And you have to, when you're learning about it and when you're understanding it and when you're teaching it, you have to grapple with that too. And you have to grapple with that emotional roller coaster you have for these people. But our brains, our brains naturally want to put people in boxes. And yeah, there are absolutely people in history that were straight up awful and full villains and all that. So we can say that. And there's absolutely people in history that you're like, wow, that person was, you know, a saint. Um, but we're talking about most of the people. We need to see that context. We need to see the context of society over time. And just again, to ring another point that Dan made, that ebb and flow of freedom and equality and how we see it as Americans across time, we have this tendency to, you know, the arc of justice bends, bends forward, bends positive, but it's more like a zigzag along the way. Um, and so you're like, great, awful, great, awful. Um, so you get that kind of ups and downs, but looking at those moments and the more you unpack it, the more you kind of dig in there, then you see this very messy path, but really informative and eye-opening because that, you know, that marketing quote, the rhythm, the pattern, you know, you, you do hear that rhythm and pattern and you see it over and over. And then you ask those questions. So why didn't they go for, farther with it? Why did that get pulled back at that time? And then you start to understand like what were those triggers that made things go in one direction or the other? And that's the fascinating application to today. So what are those triggers that move things around and put us forward in that context and in that understanding? But I also think we need to validate a few things. Number one, we need to validate the fact that we can be really upset about the past and we can be really mad and at the same time be really proud. And so it, just as much as we put people as either a hero or a villain, we have to grapple with our own emotions about our own history. We can 
both we can be both so unbelievably proud of our history and our country and at the same time have moments where we see we have shame about our actions as Americans and that's okay we're not perfect thank you <laughs> the only other kind of thing that like I will say about like putting this context in the place is make sure that your students and you feel comfortable with the debate um, over the summer we did a ton of teacher institutes and one of the things that our teachers were hearing a lot of was you know, and this debate we've had multiple times over history, is our constitution a pro-slavery or um, an anti-slavery constitution? And that is a big debate with historians right now. And they're firing things off at each other. And it's fascinating to watch. It's really interesting to watch. But we needed to take a step back and say, where is this debate coming from? And where are the perspectives from all different angles on why this conversation is coming up? We're not telling you what to think. We're just saying, here's what the, re the historians are saying around this. What do you think? How do you want to engage in this conversation? What's your perspective? So make sure that we're not having a conversation about something and not everybody has the backstory on the, on the topic. Yeah. Oh, Dan, it looks like you're going to say yeah. something. You, you, if I can, Tony, I'm just I'm, I'm just watching the, 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 the chat box now and seeing some fascinating points. And uh, Maria Gallo raises, I think, a really important question. Regardless of how a teacher thinks of things, how do you deal with specific questions like what is the difference between George Washington and General Lee? And I'll just say to go back to the point I was making earlier, I'm somewhat doctrinaire on this. I tell my students on the first day of class that my single biggest frustration with higher education are professors who, who mistake the privilege we're given to work with them as an opportunity to inflict our own opinions on them. And so on a question like this, Maria, what I do is I try, I, tried, I, I try to present both sides and say, those who want to take down Lee's statue but not Washington's will say this. These who want to take down both Washington's and Lee's will say this. And for those who don't want to take down Lee's that they will say this, if you want to know my own personal opinion on that, come to my office hours, take me to lunch. I can be bribed. <laughs> And the week of the midterms, I hand out the food for grades matrix, and it's always remarkably successful. But I think she raises just such an important question, because I do want to be respectful of these young people developing their own opinions and not feel pressured to take their own. So by offering them the options, to me, that's the best way out of what you correctly identified is a very difficult situation. I'm just going to, sorry, Tony, I'm jumping back in. Absolutely. I love Dan. I'm just like totally snapping on this. <laughs> and Dan's in a position of power as a teacher. So he knows that by offering his perspective, that would that would shift the influence even more than hearing somebody else's perspective. So it's so important to keep a balanced information and balanced conversation and give the power back to the learner, back to the students. You decide. I'll make sure and we'll talk together to make sure we have all of the voices and all the ideas and all the concepts in here. And then put put it back to you. They have agency and they have voice and they can. Excellent. Yeah. I mean, the, both of you kind of presupposed my next question, which was, you know, what tips do you have for te uh, teachers who are, you know, going to teach during especially this this very kind of partisan um, environment? And, and and I've seen a few stories of, you know, teachers trying to teach and, and you know, a, a parent who has one particularly strong belief or another or a student who has one particularly strong belief or another. Sometimes they'll, hey, my teacher's trying to indoctrinate me and they'll go to social media and then they'll get you know, canceled or vilified or, or you know, insulted uh, at a national level at this point. And it's really tough when you have, you know, beyond the classroom, let's say you em employ that both sides or I want to share, here's a story, here's a set of primary source documents. I want you to come to your own conclusion about this figure or this event in history. Um, and maybe your students are open to that, but often, especially if you're working at, at some of the, you know, middle school level or secondary level, you might have parents outside who are like, oh my gosh, this is indoctrination, or why would you want them? You have to tell them this particular way of thinking or this uh, other way. I mean, what are, what are some tips you have for teachers who find themselves often unwittingly caught in the crosshairs of this bitter partisanship that we have in our country right now? I, I'd, I'd offer a couple of thoughts. I think it's a really, really smart question, Tony. Um, one specifically toward that parent, and we still get them at the university level too. I know that there's some college instructors as part of the, this audience. Um, I have parents um, who will call me seeing if their students can get off the, their sons or daughters can get off the waiting list into my classes. And I tell them the first thing to do is to hang up the phone and tell your student to, con your, your child to contact me 
and we'll res and, and the two of us will resolve it. But on this one, I present to them the alternative. I said, I'll say, there are parents who are just as concerned as you are that I'm presenting your side instead of theirs. And if I were to tell the students only your side or only theirs, in both cases, I think I'm doing a disservice. And I'll tell the, remind the parent, I said, we're a team in this. Um, I'm going to present a range of opinions, but I get them three hours a week. The rest of the time, they belong to you, maybe less in college than in high school, but they still take, they still take my point. If you have strong feelings on these things, of course, you should share those with the students, with your children. I hope you'll acknowledge that there's equally smart people on the other side. And this is something I talk about constantly throughout the semester. I said, in such a hyper-polarized environment, it's really, really easy to take to find the outliers on the other side, the freaks, the weirdos, the stupid, the evil, and say, I can't work with the other side because look at all those, all those freaks over there. I said, on the last day of every semester, I tell my students, I said, here's my last assignment for the term. I said, it's the most important assignment I'm gonna give you all semester and I can't grade it. I said, from here on for going forward, I want every principled conservative in this class to watch Rachel Maddow once a week. And I want every principled progressive to read George Will or Ross Douthat or Brett Stevens once a week. I'm not trying to open your mind. I'm not trying to change it. I'm just trying to remind you that there's really smart people on the other side too. And what I've tried to do over the semester is make sure, without telling you which smart people are right or not, that you should be exposed to both sides of the argument so you can make your own decision. This is the second piece of advice, too, but I've talked long enough, so I want to hear what Curry thinks. <laughs> I'm going to keep going, Dan. <laughs> um, so I'll go real quick. Um, so. Um, the Constitution Center, we have the interactive Constitution. So we, we set up every constitutional question, and not many of them are easy, um, and tee up those big constitutional questions and then present both sides. So take Dan's theory, and here's a tool to put it into practice, use it. Take it, use it, take hate speech, use it. Take Second Amendment, use it. Take Electoral College, use it. It will give you the top scholarship on that constitutional question and say, here's both sides, read it, discuss it, see what you can see in agreement on both sides. And the one key thing that I love about that interactive constitution is what we want our kids to do is we want them to hear what Dan just said. The other side has a point. Like that's what you want them to think. Oh, I never thought of it that way. That's the point. We don't need anybody to change their mind, but we wanna see where they're coming from. So what we did with our scholars is we made them agree first. So the first kind of explainer is the joint explainer. You have to, they had to write down everything that they agreed upon. These are people that do not typically get along in the field, but they do. And they said, oh my God, there's so much of this history and this case law around the constitutional question that we agree upon. Here's where we diverge. And then you go into that. And then you could have dialogue. So one, use not just our resources, but the resources from all the civic ed providers. I know the Reagan Foundation just joined the Civics Renewal Network. That is another great resources. Everybody's nonpartisan. Yes, yeah, I'm glad you guys are on. Um, everybody's nonpartisan. We represent ways to have both sides. And then you, they will give you tools to bring in multiple perspectives and then use us. So if you're having a dialogue on the Second Amendment, on the Electoral College, on voting rights in America, and you want to let the parents know before that happens, which is, I think, depending on the grade, it may be a really good thing to do. And to say like, hey, we're going to have this conversation with your student. So if they come home asking questions, we want you to be prepared. Here are the tools we're using. We're using the National Constitution Center, who is nonpartisan and has the top scholars on all perspectives. So we're here to have your back in that way. We do teacher training. You can say you've been certified by us in our teacher training. We can support your school. We can support your principals. We're here to help you because we want you to have these conversations. We want you to be empowered in not just the constitutional questions, the multiple perspectives, but the tools of how to engage in an open and civil dialogue so you can hear different perspectives. The only other thing I would add to that is get your kids talking to other kids. Not every community has a diverse classroom in it. 
Um, you know, colleges sometimes have a little bit more diverse, but there's a lot of civic ed providers. We're one of them that can help you set up where we get your kids from Philly to talk to your kids from Iowa and make sure that they have a conversation on the big uh, questions, on the things that matter to them, but they get to hear different perspectives. And as you know, the nerdy um, educator that I am, we know that when you actually listen to each other, your ability to understand where they're coming from and believe that that person's coming to you with genuine, um, genuine trust and genuine ability to share knowledge increases. So hearing those conversations with each other is so much more impactful than just reading alone. There's my neuroscience nerd <laughs> comment for the day. Excellent. <laughs> One thing I'll add to, to, to Curry's last point about kids, young people talking to each other. For those of you who are teaching at the high school level, if you're not familiar with it, I've had the privilege of advising an organization called Junior State of America. Um, and we, I, I joke that we're sort of the domestic version of the Model United Nations. And it's a terrific way for young people to learn about matters of public policy, but also learn how to discuss and debate them with those who who disagree. And I think it's a, uh, a a really neat opportunity, particularly in election year. If your schools don't have a chapter, um, I'm gonna put my email address in the chat box in a minute, and I'm more than happy to connect you. And because I'm already recognizing that Curry and I are gonna barely scratch the surface of this conversation, I know that I'd be more than happy to follow up with anyone who would like to talk further, not just about JSA, but about the other points that we've discussed over um, over the course of this program. So here you go. Excellent. Yeah. And I'll, I'll, I'll just, uh, I'll, I'll say one more thing on, on that. I, uh, I was, um, uh, at the, uh, NCSS conference a couple of years ago, I had the honor to lead the teacher of the year panel, uh, where they were sharing some of their, um, techniques. And one of the teachers, uh, kind of moved, he talked about the both sides issue and encouraging debate in his classroom, but he talked about how he shifted debate, which prioritizes a winner and a loser and really focused on discourse in the classroom. And how do you get to the point where you're seeking to understand rather than seeking a victory, uh, which I thought was a really interesting way to, to you know, present both sides. Um, so we've, we've spent a lot of time on the constitution, which makes sense, it's the constitution day. And I think we could probably spend another six hours uh, just on this comp uh, conversation. But I wanna shift a little bit into to voting and voting education. You know, We talked about the challenges and teaching the history uh, in, a, in a polarized environment. We have an election this year. I'm, I know everyone knows it's on the top of the mind. You know, when's the last time the, the Postal Service was front page news? When was the last time you know, laws concerning the election of Rutherford B. Hayes uh, were, were trending uh, in various major media sources? Uh, so there is quite a bit that's going on with, with voting this year. Um, our country is facing a number of you know, kind of uh, once in a lifetime issues that have all converged at the same time. It's the perfect storm of politics and, and issues and that sort of thing. Um, so teaching voting education, I think, could be particularly tricky for, for teachers this year, but it also seems particularly necessary. Uh, so this one, I'm going to start with with Dan um, and in and, and your experience around elections. And obviously you've been a, a front row participant to the political process that, that leads up to the elections. Um, what advice would you have for teachers about voter education in the year 2020? Uh, I think the point that Curry and I were making just a moment ago about the importance of presenting both sides um, is an important one. And it's much, much trickier um, in such, not just a contemporary, but such a high stakes environment. So for example, um, voting by mail. Um, the President of the United States has argued very forcefully that voting by mail can lead to voter fraud. Um, as it happens, um, I don't agree with that, but I feel like I would be doing a disservice to my students by not presenting that as one side of the argument and also pointing out that it's not a purely partisan argument. It's not just Democrats saying vote by mail and Republicans saying not to, that in fact, the Republican National Committee and state Republican parties are mounting aggressive mail efforts. Um, so I'll tell them what the rules are. And I want to make sure they understand, not just for them, but for their parents in such a confused media environment. I said, go, I, I said, make sure your parents know, um, not just for those of you who are old enough to vote, but make sure the people in your family know also, or know what the deadlines are know where early voting can take place. 
um, know how vote, vote, vote by mail works and take the Postal Service seriously when they say to vote early and at least seven days in advance just to avoid the uh, potential complications. But I think the most important thing here, and this is a little bit less philosophical, Tony, and very, very practical, because I know we're a little bit short on time, because there's one thing we can get out to as many ears as possible, students, parents, community, and that's the strong likelihood that we're not going to have final results on election night. I've been tracking public opinion polling on this, and the media, to my pleasant surprise, has been doing a pretty decent job on this. About a month ago, only one third of respondents in the polls that I saw showed that only only one third understood the likely the possibility that our results would not be available on election night. We're now up to two thirds and a little bit more, but 30% of the American people expecting results on election night um, leaves us ripe for panic, for increased distrust, and possibly even unrest. And the more we all do as educators to make sure our students, that their friends, that their parents know that this could be election week or even election month, I think we're not only doing our students a great service, but we're each in our own small way playing a contributing role to helping keep society civil in what could end up being a very, very difficult and challenging post-election time period. Excellent. Yeah. And I think that's it. I mean, that's going to be for, for teachers and many of us, you know, in our lifetime, most elections have been called an election night. Obviously, Bush Gore in, in 2000 is an exception. And, and I think there was a couple of states that, you know, took a little while longer to figure out in the last election. Uh, but, you know, making sure that our, our students and, and their families know that. Uh, Curry, what about you? When you look at kind of the history of the, the Constitution and the history of voter election, vote election um, that sort of thing, uh, what what sort of tips do you have for teachers? Um, so we, we scheduled all of October programs to be election, election, election. So Dave's totally right. It's like now until November 3rd, let's start talking about elections in every possible way. So, you know, the electoral college, you have to dive into what the heck is that thing? Why did they pick it? And then what's the, what's the controversy around it today? Because it's connected to the voting. And if you don't understand the system, how do you understand, you know, the vote and then how it actually works? And then when we look at voting, you know, and this is connected to federalism. The original Constitution left very little, uh, you know, it very said very little about voting in the original Constitution. It left almost everything up to the state. So when we talk about why does one state have a mail-in voting system and another state is resisting it, 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 that gets a little confusing for students until you understand how it works. So we look at the, these big questions of how does voting work in America? Whose job is it to regulate it? How does the system actually work? Can they do that? Which is a typical question that we hear from students around any voting question week. Can they do that? And it's like, well, let's, let's look and see if they can do it. And then they, in, the, uh, the ability to vote in America. So the 13th, the 14th, the 15th Amendment, the 19th Amendment, the Voting Rights Act of 1965, giving them that foundation and all those pieces brings you up to these modern conversations. And, you know, we're all learning so much about this, which is why we're constantly adding more to the mix. And that's great. That's what makes the conversation interesting. You pull from the past to make it make sense today. I just watched an entire podcast on absentee ballots and how they bloomed during the Civil War. Who knew? Did not know that at the time. Um, and so where I have taught many classes on voting rights in America, and I just missed that, but it was a fascinating way to look at absentee ballots and mail-in ballots and what's our country's history and relationship to those two things. Um, and then whose job is it? This is what I love about elections and voting for students is it gets very local. You know, there is absolutely a national conversation, a national vote going on, but at the same time, there's a lot of rules, regulations, and law that's happening locally. So what's going on in your town, in your community, and in your state around elections that affect that national level. So what a great way, and again, here I nerd out again, to play with federalism and to see federalism in action and something you really care about. You're teaching voting, you're teaching electoral college, and you're teaching federalism. Trifecta. 
of beautifulness. So dive in there. There's lots of tools online from all the providers to help you with this. And don't be scared of it because you really can teach a lot about it and ask the kids to go look, go find out and go ask what's happening in their community. Are they doing drop boxes? I mean, Pennsylvania, that's everybody's fighting about drop boxes right now. That's the big thing um, and how that's going to work. So it, it's different for each state what those moments are. Um, but why did your state get like that? And D.C. has a lot of conversations going on in that area as well as Maryland around local election voting for 16 year olds. Do you want to get kids interested in it? Say, hey, do you want to vote? You can change that in your local election if you wanted to, or do you think we shouldn't and have those conversations? So it is, if you want to see the constitution in action, you're in the middle of Excellent. it. Excellent. I, so I want to ask you, happen. but this is more of an opinion question, but you know, they're, they're obviously uh, the election and, and votes and how they're counted. And obviously it, it, it varies, you know, kind of massively. I'm seeing stories about, you know, stories in the news about voting machines in Georgia that are still trying to determine whether or not they're going to be allowed to use them. I saw just yesterday uh, there was a, a, a case before, I think, a, either a federal uh, appeals court about um, uh, former felon voting in Florida and, and whether or not that'll be allowed. And, and uh, you know, here in L.A. County, and I don't, I'm not sure if this, you know, we can we can track our mail-in ballots from the time they're sent to us until they get received. And, you know, it obviously it varies quite a bit from each locality, what, what that voting looks like. Um, in terms of how to, to teach students about this in, in these different hyper localities, are there any great resources out there? Or would you encourage teachers to, you know, just investigate and have students learn and, and detail what the voting process looks like in, in their area? Is that, you know, what kind of tips would you have for how they can support students and then the families that extend out of those the students they have in their classroom? The, the, the two best sources I've seen nationally that break it down by state by state rule is both the Axios news website, AXIOS, and the Washington Post have probably the two most detailed and in depth and helpful state by state guides in how to uh, uh, understand the rules in your own uh, in your own state and in your own community. Um, the Secretary of State's website in whatever state you're in, the Registrar of Voters website in whatever locality you're in. Um, what I try to do, and I know a elementary or a high school or the secondary uh, schedule is a little bit less forgiving, is we set aside time for current events discussion at the end of class each week and try to apply what we talked about in the first part of class to what's going on in the news, to going back to what we said earlier, to put this in historical context. Um, just real quick, Tony, and then I'll, I'll turn it over to Carrie to be smarter than me on this again. But I'm going to offer just two quick, uh, what I, I, maybe perhaps last thoughts. One is a presumptive piece of advice. We talked earlier about advice when parents want to engage on whether we're presenting fairly or, or unfairly. Um, the other, the other topic that I think is worth addressing, and it is somewhat presumptuous because I know the people who are participating in this program um, have been doing this for a long time, um, but that's making it relevant to students. And what I found is in addition to the historical context that Curry and I are talking about, I try to explain the political dynamic or the governance dynamic in a personal or cultural one. So one quick example, if we're talking about the rights of the minority, I'll talk about four or five of them going out for dinner on a Friday night. And if three of the students want to go to one restaurant and the other student wants to go somewhere else, how do you make sure that that fourth you know, person still wants to come with you? How do you accommodate them in some way? And it sounds silly. It sounds even a little bit infantile, but starting with very basic interpersonal examples can help them understand when you scale up to something in terms of governance or constitutional. And then lastly, what I found with my college students, and you may have found this as well, is particularly during a time of coronavirus, a lot of young, frustrated and frightened young people saying, it's not fair. Why me? Why have I lost my sports season? Why can't I have the school play I wanted to be in? Why can't I play in the school band? How come I have to go to school online? And I try to go on, again, going back to the points that Karina have been talking about, 
I try to put this for them in some historical context. And I actually, I wrote a, a op-ed that in the form of a, a letter to the class of 2020 last spring, trying to help them understand why as frustrating as things seemed now, and it is unfair to them, that how to think about it in a longer context in terms of their broader goals for once they're finished with their own education. And in addition to the other things we've been force feeding you in the chat box, I just uh, posted the op-ed and hopefully can be at least of some help to, to a few of you. Excellent. Well, I'll turn it over to Curry. Yeah, I have reading. Okay. Oh, I was just gonna... sorry. Jumped on you. Oh, I was just going to say we, we have about ten minutes left. So, so to all of our teachers in the audience, if you have any questions you'd like to post either of our panelists, go ahead and pose them in the uh, in the chat there, and, and we'll make sure we get to them. But I uh, I didn't mean to step on you there, Curry. I just wanted to give our audience a chance to ask any questions. So go ahead. I'm just excited about Dan's op-ed because I'm going to be reading that as soon as we're done. Um, so I'm liking the chat box links. So I'll do this real quickly. Again, Constitution Center. So we're going to look at the constitutional questions around voting. I would start with absolutely giving them framing around the, the process we have for voting for our president. Because I think it, there's a lot of stuff going on with voting right now. And it can feel overwhelming. Um, and it's hard to parse out. So it, as a visual brain that I have, I would start making charts for my kids. What questions do you have? What are the questions about? who can vote and can you vote and where do they start with and then break it down and say, okay, what is the system we have electoral college? What is the controversy around that pro and con um, and then move on to voting rights? Who can vote? When can they vote? When can they not vote? And how does that work? That really leads you into how are we voting today and who's allowed to vote with that? So just, it, I would say it is such a beast that you might want to kind of strategize and organize it. But Dan is absolutely right. You want to give the agency to the, to the students, you know, can they vote? Jenny uh, pointed out that in California, her 17-year-olds are allowed to vote if they're going to be 18 by November, um, 18 by November election day, which is awesome. So that's a great question. Like, wait, can you vote? Who can and who can't and where you are? Um, what states can you do that? And it's a really easy way to bring them into it and then start organizing how it works. So they can be engaged in that conversation around voting and then look at the methods of how do we vote. Um, I, I just wanted to like ring one more thing, Bell, that Dan said earlier, that we won't have election results. Let's use our students to be able to keep sharing that information because I think it's gonna scare a lot of people um, and it's going to feel very different. Um, and you feel like we get more and more technically savvy, why is it taking longer? And all of those questions are things we should probably be talking about. So when we get into understanding that we might have a popular vote and um, uh, the popular vote might be different, who wins the popular, who wins the election might be different, let's prep our kids before we get to those conversations of them actually happening to understand what that means and how it works and how we've seen that in our past and when it mattered, when it didn't, and what, how it played out. So when they get to that moment, if it happens or if it doesn't, they're prepared to engage in that conversation and feel prepared for that. Because that makes you feel safer when you understand what's happening. So give them lots of information now, prep them, and, and have fun with it. And then one more thing, I'll just stop after this. Oh, okay. We think about so much in life, sorry, <laughs> we, so much in life, you know, think about it. Like everything you do, you do for years before you actually go do it. Like nobody gives you the keys to a car and says, by the way, it's a stick. Good luck driving it. Like you practice. So how do we get our kids to practice voting um, and practice that behavior? It's scary the first time you go into a voting booth. And like, I think goodness I had, I, my pop-up took me and I was so lucky to have that family member bringing you. And we know that it's a learned behavior and people then think of themselves as like, I'm a voter, I'm civically engaged, I'm active in my community. Not saying voting is the only way. There's so many other ways to do it. I know really active people that choose not to vote because that's the choice that they're making. But these civic activities need practice. Just like walking, just like running, we play in everything else in our life. Let's play in civics too. Um, and and look at the local and the national level. 
Absolutely. And we have about five more minutes. I, I'm seeing a couple of people sharing. Let's see, Renee sharing a story of voting with her grandmother and, and you know, kind of questions about what civic engagement looks like in, in the era of, of, of the pandemic. Um, but I'll, I'll throw a question to you and then maybe we'll wrap up with some final closing thoughts uh, before we give people a couple of minutes before they head off to their networking and, uh, and expo and, and sessions and that sort of thing. But, um, you know, we, we've talked about the voting process. And my question is about voting turnout, you know, for for a, for a democracy, even in presidential elections, the United States is typically middle or lower end for, for what democracy looked like in terms of voter participation, right? I think our last election was sub 60% in the national election at, net, at local elections, it's, it's a little bit lower. Um, what do you see, um, you know, obviously the, the pandemic presents a pretty major obstacle for voting and along with mail, mail-in balloting and stuff like that. Do you see that, or do you predict, do you think we'll have a lower turnout than we have had in the past? There's a lot of energy, a lot of folks who say, oh my gosh, look at all the things that are at stake. We got to get the vote turned out. What do you foresee as uh, potentially being, you know, what does voter participation look like in this election? Well, I think Dr. Fauci is probably better equipped to pre predict that outcome than either of us are. And certainly if, as the weather gets cold, we do see a, a resurgence in the number of COVID cases, that's going to have a, uh, a very significant impact. But I'd offer you two quick thoughts uh, without lapsing into prediction, is in the primaries that have taken place, not in the immediate aftermath of the outbreak, um, but oh, those that took place over the summer and fall, is sadly COVID became almost a new normal for many of us. Mm -hmm. Turnout has skyrocketed, even after both parties' nominations were long since decided. Um, number one, uh, I guess I have three. Number two, the requests for mail ballots across the country are just off the charts. The state of North Carolina was the first state in the country to start sending out mail ballots last week, uh, a week ago Friday. And they have had over 10, I don't have the data in front of me, but they've had over 10 times as many requests for mail ballots this year than they did in 2016. Um, and then third, I think, and this is more uh, political than governance as an old campaign guy, it's very clear to both candidates or their advisors right now that neither one of them is going to win by persuading the dwindling number of undecided voters in the center of the political spectrum and to the degree that both, Trump more than Biden, but to the degree that both are prioritizing turnout from their respective bases, I'd say all three of those things, barring a humongous resurgence of the, of the virus, suggest a historically high turnout in in November. Craig, do, do you have any thoughts there? I'm gonna leave this one to Dan. This is his world of expertise. I'll just stay into the, the history and the civics. Uh, education part of it. Oh, sure, sure. All right. Well, with that, we have a couple minutes left. So I wanted to give you both a, an opportunity for a minute or so, of, you know, any any closing remarks, thoughts, any highlights? What's the key takeaway you want today's teachers to, to walk away with as they head to their classroom next week during Constitution Week? Please, Curry, go ahead. Uh, well, number one, thank you. Just, again, I think Dan started with that and I'll end with that. And thank you so much for everything you do. And we do feel like we're constantly putting more and more burdens on you to do even more. Um, but it's the ability for our educators across our country to rise to the challenge has been mind blowing. Um, to watch it as both a civic education provider and a parent, I am just like in awe. Um, it is not easy. You're dealing it with your families as well as other people's families and it's impressive. Remember that the National Constitution Center as well as all the other civic providers are here to help. We're going into Constitution Week we have four live or six live classes next week, one with Neil Gorsuch to talk all about the Constitutional Convention and today's conversation. So please use our tools and email us. Email me whenever you want. That is my job to help you. So do not feel like you can't ask us for things. We are here to help you. So thank you for what you do. Please jump into the Constitution, and if you need any supports, we will get them for you. Um, and don't shy away. This is really important, and you're changing the field, um, and you're changing our country and our democracy. So thank you very much. What Curry said. Um, I'll, I'll offer three very quick points before you go off to uh, the next part of the program. Um, number one, the single most reliable indicator 
on whether someone will cast a ballot when they turn 18 years old is whether they live in a household with at least one parent who votes. And particularly for those young people whose parents don't vote or who are not able to vote, it seems to me that's our special obligation. So first gen students in particular, but any young person who comes from a household where their parents aren't voting, they have even more of an obligation to reach out to them. And I'll go back to what I said earlier, not just the what, not just the rules of voting and the history of it, but the why. The idea that if you don't vote, somebody who stands for some for the things that you would spend a lifetime fighting gets your vote too. And if there are things happening locally, the state level or nationally that you don't like, this is your chance. Um, and then lastly, uh, my the same plug that I offered the social studies teachers uh, back earlier this year, in most states in the country, uh, civics education, as all of you know better than me, is a one semester uh, drive-by. 15 weeks in California, 15 weeks of civics, government, and geography, all crammed into one semester in 11th and 12th grade, which means that through no fault of any of you, you guys are overcoming this. But that means we are telling our next generation of leaders and our next generation of voters that this politics stuff, this government stuff, this democracy stuff is so unimportant, we're not gonna bother teaching it to you for your first 10 years of school. But now we want you to turn around 18 months later and become responsible citizens and regular voters. And I recognize to, uh, to second Curry's point, the incredible burden and the incredible challenge that puts on all of you to share this information and to inspire these young people with both the what and the why in such an absurdly short period of time, but we're counting on you. And if we don't want to go through a year like 2020 again with recessions and pandemics and increased racial tensions, it's going to be because the young people you send to us at Berkeley and SC and Pepperdine and colleges and universities all over the country, it's because they came out of your classroom with an understanding that even before in the constitution they say, um, a more perfect union, they start by saying, we the people. And if our students understand that they're part of that we, then you have all achieved something extraordinarily valuable. So keep doing what you're doing and, I'll, and we'll applaud you for it. Excellent, yeah. Well, thank you so much, Curry and Dan, for this morning's discussion. I appreciated it tremendously. Uh, would have loved to have done it in person, but obviously we can't do it that way. As uh, John Downey said in the chat, let's make some lemonade. I think we're making some lemonade out of Constitution Day. Teachers, I think, as a profession, are those who make better lemonade than anybody else. We know the challenges you faced as, as Dan went into it. I saw a note yesterday that said every teacher feels like a first-year teacher this year. Um, and so thank you all for, for showing up today. Um, before I wrap up, I just want to give a couple of quick stage directions. Uh, so next up on the schedule... Uh, we have breakout discussions. So if you want to talk further with uh, colleagues uh, about what you've just heard um, in the sessions tab, which should be over on the left hand side of the hop in browser uh, in just two minutes here, they're going to open up uh, by grade level and all of our planning partners um, are going to be in there leading discussions, just kind of open discussions about what you've heard, issues you're facing, be a good chance to connect with other educators from uh, around the region and around the country. Um, and then following that, our expo will be open. Uh, so you can go through and see some of the great resources that uh, the different institutions have, uh, many of which have been shared in the chat here today. And then there's also networking. It's a uh, speed networking, uh, should be fun. You click on network and uh, for up to three minutes, you can talk with somebody and, and hear a little bit about what's going on in, in their uh, classroom and uh, from around the country. Uh, so with that, I wanna say thank you so much to Curry for, for making the time. And Dan, I know uh, the demands on both of your time this time of year and leading up to the election are uh, immense. Uh, and so we thank you for taking the time to join us here today. Uh, and with that, we're going to say farewell, give everybody a, a minute or two of a break and then head into the discussion session. So thank you both very much. Thank you so much. Thank you.